Thank you so much for coming. Um, uh, welcome to I-10 Second Thursday at Venture Cafe. Um, for those of you that don't, I haven't met yet, my name is Melissa Grizzle. I'm the Director of Entrepreneur Development with I-10. Um, for those of you who don't know I-10, um, we are a nonprofit that works with tech startups. Um, we, can, we get them connected to everything they need to um, grow their businesses and uh, people join I-10 as early as really idea stage, getting at, wanting to get access to our mentors, all the way up to companies that are really growing and raising significant outside capital. And in the back of the room, Christy, you want to be my um, Anna for just a second? Sure. And because I know how much you love people to look at you, um, is our, our report that comes also with our ecosystem map and our pathway map. So if you're trying to navigate your way around the tech ecosystem and figure out who all the players are, that is a great go-to, um, so they're available there in the back. Um, if you, but one of our partners who was in this room earlier, um, Square One Boot Camp, their stuff is back there as well if you're interested in their um, fall program for business model validation. So um, we work with a lot of different uh, organizations throughout the, the tech community um, because we really put the needs of our entrepreneurs first. So whatever they need, um, we try to within <laughs> within I-10, and, um, and also through our partnerships with others. And uh, let's see what this one does. This claims to have a solid green effect, but uh, earlier this was not doing anything to I'm Is that, is that um, over there, that little, uh, the little <coughs> bot thing that's got antennae? Yeah, it's a green, green. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's <laughs> green as well. Okay, cool. Cool beans. All right, well, you know. This feels ridiculous, so um, go ahead and set that down. So, anyway, we work with a lot of really cool people throughout the ecosystem to make sure that our, our companies are connected to um, resources and education, whether with us or with, uh, again, with all the people that we work with. Matt, um, I'm excited to welcome Matt Camp, who's the Senior Vice President from Influence & Co., um, a company uh, that a uh, content marketing company, and he's actually a serial entrepreneur that was an I-10 company way back in our early existence. We've been around for 11 years, so we were just trying to figure out what year that was, probably yeah. 2009. Nine and ten, um, but we always like to, to stay in touch with those that kind of come through our, our programs and, and our circle. Um, they go on to other really cool things, and then they become um, partners and, and, and uh, uh, able to share their expertise and their wisdom. So that. Excited to have Matt here tonight, sure. and I will just let you take it from here and, and share with the community what you, all some great strategies for being an industry leader. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep it conversational, so feel free to just jump in, you know, I'll raise your hand or yell at me or whatever, uh, to, to make this uh, not me just talking at you for the next hour, but, um, and I'll definitely leave plenty of time for Q&A, but, um, yeah, you know, hopefully you're here to how to build your company's brand into an industry thought leader. Um, it's funny, the whole, <laughs> I'll be loud, the whole mic thing, it's funny whenever uh, we're, we're two blocks from here and I'll take a client on, or a new client on a tour of Vortex and they're just blown away, and then we'll get to a room and my keynote doesn't work, or my <laughs> So that's always fun, in an innovation industry, but hey, there we go, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, I wanted to say, first of all, thank you to I-10, um, for what, you know, like Melissa mentioned, um, a previous company I was at, uh, you know, it was just myself and a couple of friends in college uh, working on mobile, you know, mobile development and mobile was brand new. Um, we had no idea what we were doing and a lot of smart people like I-10 uh, helped guide us and having somebody be a mentor like that is invaluable, especially um, early on in your, in your interest within entrepreneurship. To, so to see them and the work that they do, and I know they've been around a while compared to a lot of other you know, organizations even in the community. Um, I know they're a pivotal part here, so thank you for giving me a platform as well. But um, to kind of start off, why we have any credibility in being up here? Uh, this is you know, what we do every day. We help companies turn their expertise into influence using content. And content is a very, very broad term. Uh, we really focus on written content and um, you know, especially you know, focus on how do you get that into online publications. So I'll be giving you each a playbook today on how to do that and data-driven strategies that we have directly from those editors um, telling us what they're looking for. I think I've got it working. Yeah. Okay. The people that have to watch this on video because they weren't able to join us will appreciate it if you, right. you know, humor me and use the mic. <laughs> Perfect. That works. So, 
uh, a little, like I mentioned to myself, um, had experience at uh, that mobile app development company, did a couple of things uh, between that and um, internships around town and things like that. Uh, through all that experience, I met the co-founders at Influence Co. Uh, when they first started back in 2011. Um, I came on uh, mid to late 2012, um, was one of the first kind of um, you know, six or seven employees, kind of part of that core team. Um, and it's been fun to grow that up to now we're the largest provider of expert content to online media, uh, meaning you know, thought leadership content, byline articles coming from our clients into publications. And um, we have about 80 or so full time now working on this. So it's been a really, really fun ride. And um, I, you know, I grew up in St. Louis. Um, our HQ is in Columbia, Missouri. Um, always wanted to end up back here. So moved back here when I got married. Um, had another coworker also moving back around the same time. So um, we started our office here in, in Lab 1500 originally, and then T-Rex, and here, and have just gotten to be a part of the startup community here. So um, it's great to see events like this and the turnout that comes every single week. Um, you know, when I say largest provider, I mean amount of content. I and mean, we had over 3,200 placements in 2018 from our clients into publications. So everything I'm talking about today, um, I'm going to start with the why behind content even mattering, but everything I'm talking about today we've repeated thousands of times, so um, have made it pretty turnkey and hopefully can pass some of that knowledge on to you. Um, just to start off, which you, know, you probably wouldn't be in this room if you didn't think content was valuable, but um, just a few statistics, over half of buyers, um, before they even talk to one of your sales, sales reps, um, especially on the B2B side, uh, they're over halfway through uh, their decision making process. 57%. Uh, so that's something that, that they are getting that information somewhere. 71% of B2B buyers said that they're consuming content on blogs before they, they even enter the buying, uh, during the buying process as well. So someone in your industry is owning that conversation. Um, my goal is to help you, help you understand how to be the one owning that conversation. Um, the winners in your industry are the ones that are putting out this content, putting out this fuel, and building out their brand as something, as something in the industry that people know, people trust, and people are consistently consuming your, your content. Um, well, how I'm breaking up today is in four specific phases. So uh, content strategy, starting off there, you know, what, what do we even talk about in the first place? Um, how do we keep our pay, team on the same page, all of that. Uh, content creation, so how do we create content that is impactful and people actually care about, but then also create content in a way that saves as much time as possible, because you're all busy people here. Um, content distribution, so we define that as how do you get into online publications and I've got, I have a, a five step process there that the editors themselves at these publications have told us uh, is what they're looking for. And then content maximization, so once that article is live, what do you do with it, how do you get the full value out of it? So just, just a quick uh, show of hands to start off, who in this room would say they're actively involved with content strategy in that process in general for their company? Okay. What about creating content? Is anyone actively creating content? Okay. I know content's broad. Uh, broad term. Content distribution. Is anyone like pitching publications and trying to get out there? Okay. And then maximization. Is anyone actively the one? Once an article's live, you have to figure out what to do with it. Okay. Cool. That helps give you a little bit of context. Um, for strategy, it seems like most people in the room, a lot of people uh, I talk to in general, they're at least thinking about. One, what should I be talking about? And then two, how do I create that content? So you know, this room kind of reflects that. But I'd say to start off, um, one way to get ahead of your, your, the large majority of your industry, nearly two thirds of it, uh, is by documenting a content strategy. And that's something that seems, uh, seems like it you know, might not be simply necessary, especially if you're early on, if you're uh, you know, a few person team, if you only have one person working on content. Um, but it's one, a great reminder of you know, every single time you create a piece of content, you need to know the why behind it. Just putting content out there for content's sake is not going to do anything. It's not, uh, you're not thinking about your end buyer, you're not thinking about their motivations, you're not addressing their needs by educating them using this content. Um, and then as you scale up, that's, that is going to amplify the problem. So the, the more that you can put into thinking through these elements, so thinking through you know, your target audience and who are you selling to, what are they asking you every single day, um, what are those pain points that you can address them on, and turn into topic ideas that really every objection in the sales process you hear, or any passionate conversation you have with a prospect that you need to educate them on something, that should be a piece of content, that should be an entire content campaign. 
um, target publications. So uh, doing some searching around to see what are your publication, you know, what are your, your prospects reading, and having one-on-one -on -one conversations with your prospects will, you know, is a good place to start. And understand, you know, what do you read every day? What do you subscribe to? What, uh, you know, what comes to your inbox that you're excited to open every single day? So thinking through what are those avenues that you can get in front of them in a very credible way that they're already consuming, documenting that, and having a running list of that is incredibly helpful. Um, voice and tone, goals, success metrics, um, these are all things that you need to go into it and understand just how you're communicating and what your brand means, uh, you know, how, how people want to interact with your brand, as well as uh, what does success even look like when you're creating content. Because in general, content is it's one of those strategies that you know, six months in, a year in, two years in, you're going to see exponentially more value out of it. Um, the more content you put out there, uh, when you have six, seven, eight, nine touch points with your prospects, that's when it's really going to resonate with them. Uh, and they're going to find it much, much easier uh, when it's indexed in Google and they're searching for it. They're searching for different things in their industry. That's you know, when your, your content, ideally, if you've done all this well, uh, that's when that's going to pop up. And it takes a little bit of time for Google to index that content and be able to put that in front of people. So um, consistency is key. So having a guiding north star that that you know, hey, here's what success looks like, and three months in, when we're not seeing a heck of a lot yet, like here's why we're doing this. You know, it reminds you of the end goal and what you're working towards there. So I would say starting off, documenting that content strategy is going to make you ahead of the entire game. Um, what the end goals should look like within that content strategy. There is the qualitative side, and that's a little more short, short term typically, but um, qualitative side of the value of content, and that is building influence and you know, building brand awareness and all these fluffy terms that actually do have you know, credibility. They do have a lot of value, but they're a lot harder to measure. Um, and then all the way through to the quantitative side of SEO, you know, new, new traffic, new leads, conversion rate, things like that. So when you lay out those success metrics, um, how you should be thinking about all these pieces playing together. We really preach this inbound funnel where you know, this isn't anything new. You can go on uh, you know, HubSpot and a variety of people. HubSpot turned or uh, you know, coined the term inbound, but um, there are a lot of people in the industry. If you search, up in, search inbound strategy or inbound funnel, you'll see some variation of this. But the idea is how do you reach new people, you know, in front of them, in you know, whether it be in a publication or otherwise. Um, have a content foundation to bring them back to, so that could be your on-site thought leadership, your blog, your owned media, um, something that you're consistently putting out and owning every day. Um, have calls to action for them there, so that's this gated content right here. Um, that would be you know white papers or ebooks or something that is valuable enough to warrant an email address from your prospect and ask for that in, in return for downloading something. And then once you have that email address, how do you nurture them from here? How do you continue to build that relationship with them? So that way they are excited to open an email that you send them and you're consistently giving them content where, you know, say, say for us, they download uh, the eight steps to creating a thought leadership strategy. Well, maybe we follow up and say, well, here's how you create, here's a, a blog post on how you create content. We saw you read this, you know, here's another piece that I think is going to be valuable. So that entire nurture process would be, you know, taking them from a, uh, you know, a marketing qualified lead to an actual sales conversation. Um, this entire strategy, when you're thinking through how it's going to drive ROI and how to even begin putting content out there, I would highly recommend starting with this gated content piece. So that's kind of the big rock piece of content that is going to capture the lead, and that's the piece like you know, ultimate you know, big guides or, or you know, uh, longer pieces of content that you can then break up into these other other layers. Like for us, we'll, we'll do. You know, eight steps to, to your thought leadership strategy is, I think, our most popular gated piece of content ever. Um, within that, we'll have all kinds of blog posts that are each of those eight steps. And then we'll have articles in publications that, that speak about content strategy and link back to those blog posts. So when you think through, you know, what kind of content topic should I even begin with? What's the lowest hanging fruit? Maybe I'm a startup. Maybe you don't even have uh, revenue yet or you don't even have a product launch yet. What's the lowest hanging fruit for your content strategy? I would start here. I would start with this call to action and understand what is that long-term guide that you can create that every single prospect is going to care about, every, every qualified conversation you have um, would want to download, and then work backwards from there. And really, from an SEO perspective, this is something that's actually taken from HubSpot, uh, so credit to them, but the, the actual you know, this image here kind of shows um, one strategy that especially if you're a startup early on that you should be deploying is is this content clustering with, with pillow post strategy. 
a pillar post, we used to find that as a very deep dive piece of content. Um, for us, for clients, it's usually 2,000 plus words. It's something that's extremely valuable to your prospect that they're gonna ideally spend the entire time reading. And within that, have all kinds of different subsections that you can then link other posts to. So if we did uh, you know, eight steps to, to fall into your thought leadership strategy and that was a pillar post instead of a, of a white paper, um, we would have all those eight steps lined out. We'd have blog posts from all over our blog linking back to that very specific deep dive post, the pillar post, right? That's right here. You cluster all kinds of different blog posts around that link back to that. And then anytime you get into another blog, if you can include links back to that pillar post as well, and tell Google, tell whatever search engine, hey, this piece of content really, really matters, and you have this really kind of uh, you know, saturation of links back to this post, that is how you're going to drive a ton of organic traffic. So I would say you know, thinking through that gate piece of content to start off, and especially thinking through how can you you know, create a, a cluster of content linking back to that and back to a, a deep dive post on your site, that would be the lowest hanging fruit in terms of content strategy that I would, I'd recommend starting with. So that helped me. Yes. From an opt-in standpoint, gated content doesn't seem to make sense. So talk to me about the opt-in strategy versus the gated content strategy. Opt-in as in, uh, can you define that a little bit more for me? Well, I mean, if we're driving, you know, again, let's assume based on the audience that we're not necessarily driving people to our website and the gated content that we're pushing it out. Yep. So we need to get people to opt. So we need to get people to opt in so that we can then continue to nurture and market to them. Right. So if I'm gating a piece of, con of high value content, mm -hmm. am I limiting my pool of potential? Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, that's why I think both the pillar post strategy. There are a lot of you know. It's hard to determine which, which piece of content you want gated, which piece you don't want gated, and rather have pillar, a pillar post around that. Um, so I, I would say you know, having both in tandem is going to be really, really helpful. Um, that gated piece of content should be the end goal for anybody that, that visits your site because that's the thing that you're going to be able to build a long-term relationship around. So when they download that piece of content, that should be the end goal. It should be, how do we get them here? Because once we have them here, they've given, given me permission to build a long-term relationship with them, and maybe they're ready to buy tomorrow, maybe they're ready to buy six months down the road. So I would say trying to build a pillar post in, in addition to negated content, you know, that, that would be the ideal scenario there. But um, the negated content for the 20%, yeah. really the ideal customer. Yeah, exactly. But the gated content should be your qualified lead specifically is going to be downloading this. Does that answer Yes. Great. One thing that would really help kind of explain a lot of this, um, we actually, if you go to influenceandco.com slash resource dash library, we have a lot of gated content ourselves. So <laughs> this, is, this is one piece of it. Uh, <laughs> I would say this content marketing assessment, we actually go through this with every single person that we're either, you know, either it's a you know, workshops we do, um, leads we're talking to. Um, this is really the formula that we use that if your goal is lead generation or thought leadership or SEO or multiple, they're not mutually exclusive, um, here are the deliverables or here are, you know, here's what your inbound funnel should look like. Here are all the elements that you should be thinking about. Here are the success metrics you should be thinking about to, you know, to be measuring and having a you know, first setting a baseline and then continually measure every month to understand if you're improving month over month. And then beyond that, have, here are the technical requirements that you need in place, whether it be you know, a blog and a website to begin with or something deeper than that. So th this guide, I know it's you know, a lot of text up here, but that's something that, um, it's a, a deep dive that kind of walks you through every single funnel for each individual goal there. Um, there we go. Uh, phase two, so going into it, you know, once you have that strategy in place, um, I just want to emphasize content creation. And it doesn't matter if you're the founder or a new hire. Um, it is, if you are you know, somebody who knows something in the space that you know what you're talking about, you're, you, know, you, can, you have the ability to educate your end prospect, um, I'd highly recommend investing in content and you're investing in your company, you're investing in yourself, in your personal brand. Um, really, companies aren't, you know, uh, any content you put out there, people aren't doing business with, with companies, they're doing business with people. So this content is also going to humanize your company's brand. Um, whether it be your you know, CEO, leaders internally, or, or the new hire. Um, you know, what makes a thought leader to say, oh, am I qualified to, to be able to put out content? Um, it's such a subjective term and a buzzword at this point. So I, I would say, if you're you know, somebody who can communicate well, a good storyteller, and you understand um, the value you can bring to a prospect and how to educate them, um, you know, you're qualified to be putting out content that people will care about. How to think through actual topics as well that are going to matter um, to, to your uh, end prospect. 
it, you know, I would say one, it really depends on what kind of goal you're, you're, you're looking at. You know, if you're looking at a more subjective goal and focused on personal influence and building credibility, building brand awareness, especially if you're trying to get into bigger publications, um, talking about lessons learned that only you have, your personal stories and personal experiences that you've been through, um, that's probably the number one thing those publications are looking for. Um, and then beyond that, industry news and trends weighing in on, on things that you see coming that maybe people outside of your industry don't. Um, you know, I would say start there. And then beyond that, if you're looking to win new customers, if you're looking to generate leads from this, if you're looking to answer uh, prospects' questions um, you know, and measure that as the success metric, I would say starting with those FAQs and those pain points that you're overcoming and those objections you're, you're hitting in the sales process, all of those are great uh, content opportunities. So just pay attention to how you're speaking with, with each individual customer you're talking to, whether it be you know, pre-sale and those qualifying conversations or post-sale in the customer service qual uh, conversations. Um, those are all great content opportunities. Um, and especially if you see a big education gap in the industry and something that is just a huge misunderstanding or maybe people don't even know is a solution in your space, that's another big clue to uh, you know, uh, point, make a priority around creating content on that. Another piece you'll find in that same link, uh, our knowledge management template. So this is really our secret sauce for saving people time and what we recommend people use as well. Um, you can honestly do it as simply as sharing a, a Google spreadsheet as well, but just having something that you have a, a consistent place for everyone on your team to go back to a, a, an actual, um, you know, what's great about this is it gives you different tabs and different, uh, you know, it already organizes all your information for you, but just having that consistent place that people, you know, you can train your team to go back to and when they have that passionate conversation or when they have, have something, you know, when they talk about something that would fall under one of these categories, just throw that in there, and that way, no matter what, whenever you're, you're creating an article, you have a, a consistent bank of knowledge going, and uh, maybe even have them throw a few sentences on, on things that have resonated uh, with that, that conversation, like how did you answer that question, and did that go over well, anything around that. Um, even, even if it's just stream of consciousness brain dumping into that, into that uh, particular asset, um, that, you know, having this and crowdsourcing your team's knowledge saves you an, an immense amount of time, and that's when you can hand something like this off to a freelance writer or to someone else that um, you know, will be able to learn your industry through your knowledge and to, you know, tell your stories on your behalf. So phase three, I would say you know, content distribution. This is the thing that um, for us makes us most unique, which is why we always create a white paper around this as well. Um, we haven't come out with 2019's version yet, but um, the State of Digital Media is a survey we send out to, you know, at this point we work with over 1,500 publications now online. Um, we send it out and get back one to 200 responses every single year. And it's asking them questions around, you know, basically why do they, you know, why do they, one, take our content in the first place, and two, what can, what can people create that will appeal to them, and how, how can they appeal to them? What, how can they pitch them? How can they um, really understand what they're looking for, and why do you reject a piece of content? So. Um, probably the number one takeaway, the strongest response we've gotten year over year, the last three years we've done this, is that people, these publications, want to hear from you. Like there's a huge opportunity out there for people who are in the industry every single day, in the field, know the stories and the lessons learned that these publications don't or can't report on or don't have the capacity to really report on. Um, and I, I mean, I know last year it was 94% of, of respondents said they plan to have more guest contributed content um, on their publication than the year prior. So these publications are looking for help, they're looking for people like you to help tell the story in your industry. Now how to do that, um, the, end, the end result could look something like this. Um, Zach is one of our clients, so it's you know, byline content is the, the ideal uh, placement that we that a lot of this plays to, but um, this is a, again a process that's turnkey that we've done thousands of times with clients. Um, and really I would say five elements come into play that these publications have said yes, we're looking for this. Um, First and foremost is documenting your content strategy again. Like a publication can tell when you pitch them and say, here's why this piece of content matters and kind of your, your mission around this piece of content and why it's going to matter for their specific audience. Um, that documented content strategy is a huge key to help you be able to do that time and time again. Um, so check, you already uh, taken, taken notes on that one today. Um, research your target audience, so thinking niche around your publications, really understanding, um, you know, it, it, the, the quantity of audience doesn't nearly matter as much as the quality of audience, especially when you're focused on on uh, you know prospects coming to you back to you and wanting to buy from you. So for us, when we're publishing in 
Content Marketing Institute or the HubSpot blog or uh, you know a very specific industry blog that reaches content marketers specifically, we have way more qualified leads come from that than even like an entrepreneur article or Forbes or something like that. So um, yes, the other publications are great for credibility, for brand awareness, but not necessarily qualified leads. But when you say publication, are you talking strictly print? Or is it a mixture of print and online? Or, and what's the percentage? Yeah, so we focus on online um, for a variety of reasons. Like I would say the SEO value of getting an online publication is extremely powerful. Sure. Um, especially if they link back uh, to, your, to your, uh, you know, your own site. Um, it's a lot easier to share and be able to distribute further. But print does have you know, at least the credibility to it as well. So if your end goal is, hey, I want to be seen as this credible you know, speaker or somebody who um, you know, is coming to the, the sales conversation already in advantage uh, because they see you as an expert in what you do, um, print you know, isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, but most of these responses are from the online editors as well. So, the, and also the niche publications as well, those are the ones that have um, especially small teams that are working on them, they, they need content from somewhere, um, you have a big opportunity to supply them with, with free content and say, hey, here's why I'm credible to be talking about this subject. Um, so, cool, thinking about that. Uh, sharing your expertise, like I mentioned, um, personal stories, lessons learned, the things that you have and you've experienced while, you know, yourself. Um, is what these publications are, are craving, and they want those unique stories that no one else, they, that you can't find anywhere else. So um, you know, the, the editor responses definitely reflected that. Um, they also reflected the fact that you do not, uh, they, they have a, a high uh, sensor for being uh, overly promotional as well. So if you're linking back to direct, directly back to a buy now page, or you're just pitching your product the entire time, probably not gonna, not gonna publish that. <coughs> Um, but I would say, in, in general, you know, as long as you focus on education first and, and giving value, um, you know, you can't you can't overshare. I mean, it's something that even if you're afraid that your prospects gonna see this and say, oh, I'm gonna take this guy and go run with it, um, you know, it's a great idea for them. But usually, when they go through that exercise, they, they uh, see just enough that they know they need your help. Um, so that, that content really educates them to the point that um, they know they need somebody else to, you know, they need the real experts to take this off their shoulders because they're doing everything else, running their business. Um, backing it up with data, and especially if you can use primary research, um, that's one way to stand out extremely well. Like this, uh, you know, this survey I'm talking about right now, um, this is the primary research I'm talking about, is understand what are those assets that you have that access to that no one else in your industry has. And, for us, that's the publication relationships and the one-on-one -on -one, uh, candor we build with them to give us data like this. Um, but whatever that equivalent is in your industry and that your company has, um, think through that. How can you turn that into data that can then inform a content strategy? And then finally, edit, edit, edit. And that's something uh, I would guess most people in here put together a resume in this room at some point. Um, you know, think through whenever you're submitting a piece of content, you're reflecting. Uh, yourself to them, but then also if they hit live on that article and there's something egregious in there that's just totally off and uh, you know whether it's their boss or somebody reading the article calls it out, that's going to reflect poorly on, on you as well. So think through everything uh, from an editing standpoint, you know, highly recommend professional editors there. Um, you know, I, I know I'm, I think I'm a good editor, but then I'll go through and just get it torn apart by an editor internally. So uh, you know, learn, learn from my uh, mistakes there. And then finally, success. So, you know, that's something right there. Kelsey Myers, our CEO. Um, when I talk about Content Marketing Institute, that's kind of the, the gold standard in our specific niche uh, in trade publication. Um, so it's, you know, exciting to see us get published there and, and see things like that. And especially, you know, goals like this, or, you know, articles like this have a goal around driving prospects and leads back. So there's a very quantitative uh, ROI attached to an article like this. And then finally, um, I don't want to leave plenty of time for a Q&A here. Um, Content maximization. So most people, when they publish an article, they think they're at the finish line. You know, they think that, oh yeah, like great, we got the, you know, Forbes or whatever it is. Like, you know, everyone's going to visit our site, and we're getting you know, uh, all kinds of customers from this. And it, you know, it, while it is valuable, it does take consistency. It takes, you know, the the uh, that that content should be seen as an asset to drive everything else that you're doing, not the end product. Um, that you should just let go. You know, it's it's uh, then a, a weapon to use within marketing and PR, and use it as fuel within social, use it as fuel within your newsletter, repurpose it all over the place. 
um, sales enablement. So giving that to your sales team and saying, hey, whenever you hear a lead, ask about this or ask about that. Here's an article that we just got published in a publication that you can share with them that educates them on that. And then also, you know, your prospect sees, wow, they're getting published in this publication. You know, it builds trust with them more quickly. So you're using, uh, arming the sales team with it. Uh, training and recruitment. You know, this inbound funnel idea uh, for leads can also apply for hiring and employer brand and getting in front of the best talent. So think through how can you use that content within nurturing uh, you know, uh, talent leads as well. Uh, executive branding and investor relations. That's something that we see people consistently use this content to land speaking opportunities and to open doors within the investor community and uh, you know be able to, to nurture uh, you know their, their investor relationships and build trust and credibility there quicker. Um, so we actually have a uh, maximizing your published content guide as well. I tried to include as many of these kind of takeaways and, and uh, you know, playbooks as I could, uh, so that way you you know you can uh, you know read on your own time because a lot of this can get pretty in depth. But um, yeah, if you if you go there, you can find that guide as well. But I would say you know uh, most people who are uh, from a content marketing perspective, most people who are actually uh, uh, I think it was Gardner that put this out, but. Um, most people who are actually actively practicing content marketing are spending more time on this than they are even creating the content. So just to kind of give you an idea on ratio of how much content should I be putting out there versus what should I do with that content, try to spend most of your time leveraging that asset rather than just creating it. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of, of a framework. Um, I've got about 25 minutes here, so I'm, I'm happy to open up the questions and um, you know, we'd love to hear, hear uh, you know, what I brought you here today. Sorry, I'm gonna drive this because I gotta talk. Go ahead. Um, so let's talk about um, help us here. Uh -huh. I subscribe to Haro. Yep. Okay, so I actually, uh, so does everybody know what Haro is? Mm -hmm. Upper Reporter app. So that it's a, a reporter network that they'll submit a question and say, hey, does anybody know a trend in this space or this space? And you can answer that question. You get emails from them three times a day. I'll sit here afterwards. You can come see me. I'll show you the emails that I got today. Super useful, yeah. Super useful. So, so A, that's, been a, so I got actually got a podcast interview nice. off that. The author or the, the gentleman who did the podcast just contacted me last week and said, "Hey, I'm going to write a book, and now I want you to be a chapter in the book." Yeah. So that was like, I mean, and it's free. So like that was a huge domino for me mm -hmm. that worked out really nicely. What other things like? So let's say that Entrepreneur Magazine isn't super interested in me right now. Right. Yep. <laughs> um, so so what other Haro type opportunities are out there that we don't know about? Yeah, I mean, really, I mean, the niche publication thing is really, I, I want to hammer it home again, just because that, that, those are the editors. How do we find reading. that? You, have, you said, you said, ask your prospects what they're reading. Yeah. I'm not, but I mean, like, some of the things that I, that I apply to uh -huh. be a content expert on or, or a, a, you know, quote on, mm -hmm. I've never heard of some of these people, so I'm not sure yeah. I would have found them on my own. Yeah, and um, there are a couple of tools like Technorati used to be a, a directory around that. I'm, I'd have to check to see if that's still uh, something in there that they're actively doing. Um, Moz, the SEO tool, will identify a lot of things like that for you. Um, and then I know we use, um, oh my gosh. Uh, if it comes to me, I'll think of it. Our publications team uses another uh, general kind of, anything that's uh, Moz related, Moz type tools that are in the SEO world. Look up Moz versus. Uh, I don't know what that means. Sorry, like, I'm like, I'm no, it's okay. MOZ, it's an SEO tool that uh, has, also has directories around uh, things like uh, domain authority and things like that. And those are all metrics that they measure that they can then say, here are the publications in your space that are powerful when you get a link back from them. So using that as a way to kind of nail down priority and say, hey, let's go to, you know, let's use Moz to look up high domain authority links or your publications, and then based on that, let's go through and see which ones have I heard of, which ones have I not, and maybe the ones that you haven't heard of, but are a powerful link back, uh, might be more open to your pitch as well, because they, you know, they- Matt, explain like high domain authority. Uh, domain authority is a metric that actually, Google doesn't put it out, but the, SC, the search engine optimization industry talks about pretty frequently, that um, is a measurement to understand how powerful a link back is, or a, how powerful, how authoritative a particular site is. So whenever you get a link back from that site to your own site, that's you tell that site telling Google, these guys know what they're talking about, this is a credible piece of content. So high domain authority is a very, very good thing in the eyes of these search engines, and anytime you have the opportunity to coordinate with a publication that can do that, or that has a high domain authority, um, that's incredibly valuable. 
So do you feel like benchmarking is a common kind of strategy in this industry? Are you looking at you know other people in your industry that you like think are good companies and saying like, okay, well this is what they're doing for a big player. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll do something similar to that, or is that yeah, it, it's, it's advice against that? No, it's good to be aware of what they're doing. Um, I would say first and foremost, understanding what makes you unique and the, the stories and lessons learned that only you have are just what's going to drive the most um, the most interest and going to stand out the most. Um, so being aware of what other competitors are talking to you or, or talking about will help inform that strategy. But the things that make you unique, like for us, it's the publication side, it's the content creation process, it's other things like that. And your unique spin on that um, is what's going to really stand out. Yeah, I guess I also mean like where are you published? Like, yeah. Have you seen? Oh yeah. Like, okay. like looking for like like kind of following up on what she's saying. Uh -huh. Like who's important? Like you look at companies that are succeeding. I think like well they're publishing in these. Right. They're putting their content here, so maybe you so maybe go out of different content. Like, put yeah. It there. That's definitely a good indicator. Like I would say, um, you know, if you're if you're paying attention to your industry and understanding that, oh wow, like you know, one of our competitors is publishing here, they're at least aware of that that issue, and they, they know that oh, this this type of industry and this type of, of topic is something that our prospects care about enough to for them to say, hey, let's publish it. That can be a very good indicator to, to, to then say, hey, maybe we should follow them too. So um, yeah, good tip. So how about promoting, once you have a piece published, like I'll have pieces published on dataversity.com. Yeah. Once I've done that, then I go about promoting it, yeah. like spamming LinkedIn groups and things like that. So what would you recommend there? Like what are effective ways to promote, you know, your piece once you get uh -huh. published? What, what would you say, are you using it more as a credibility builder or trying to get drive leads from it, or what was your end goal with that? Uh, my end goal was to drive people to that blog post yep. to drive people to my website. Yeah, I mean, using it, one, first and foremost, within every sales conversation is going to be uh, very effective, be able to use it as a way that you, whether you're, you're uh, nurturing a lead that you know, is giving you an email address, they, hopefully they've downloaded uh, a gay piece of content on your site because you're creating that now too. Um, you know that uh, using it to fuel that, that newsletter and using it as lead nurture content to get them on the phone to begin with is really uh, going to be you know, uh, kind of low hanging fruit there. Um, and then using it within particular sales conversations, whether it be um, you're already talking to somebody or you're reaching out to them on a LinkedIn, um, you know any kind of platform like that. We do that frequently. Um, yeah, I mean we'll, we'll repurpose it within social. We, we repurpose it within uh, speaking. Um, you know things like this. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's something that you'll learn over time as you do more, but, um, you know, that, that guide that I mentioned gives kind of a full laundry list of all the stuff that, that we've done and then we've seen our clients do successfully as well. Okay. So. Uh, what about video content? Uh, yeah. Maybe a subject matter expert from your company mm -hmm. talking about an industry problem and not mentioning that you got the solution, but mm -hmm. someone trying to do that. Do you find that to be effective? Or? Yeah, I, a good point. I mean, like, I would say anything, any content you're putting out there, focusing on being educational first and foremost, is uh, you know what's going to get people to engage with it most and share it out with their with their networks as well. Um, video content for sure. I think it just depends on what your most uh, comfortable medium is. So um, if you're you know if you'd rather speak and you'd rather uh, be on video than than write, you know some people are writers and authors and things like that, and you'd rather do that every day. Um, and find that easier to communicate. Some people are great on video and speaking of things, and um, it's something that video, the, the advantage you have there, it's very easy to repurpose that content as well. So um, turning that transcript into a blog post or putting that into a podcast or other things like that or on YouTube or whatever it might be, um, you know, it's a great piece to be able to repurpose. So I would say go with what you're most comfortable doing and then, um, you know, video, if that's the default, that's great. Um, the one thing about video is we uh, are actively, and that's a question we ask our publication editors all the time, is um, you know what type of content you prefer. And um, for right now, they, they, that written content is what they, I mean, video they would you know, not like, but um, the written content is the thing that they see the highest demand for and are actively asking for to be able to submit it to them. So um, getting into publications, you probably have to have a blog post in addition to that article at the very least. Um, but but it's still it's a great piece of content to be able to, to repurpose and use it on a variety of ways. And do you find that uh, feeds into say LinkedIn channels, LinkedIn, uh -huh. uh, it may be effective as well. Yeah, uh, 
In terms of like LinkedIn as a lead gen strategy? Or? Yeah, that, that, uh, in terms of social, that's, that's our uh, best cost per acquisition. Like I would say LinkedIn is our most effective uh, networking tool on social period. So um, especially if you're a B2B company, then then yeah, for sure use it on, on LinkedIn. And, um, paid LinkedIn or not paid LinkedIn? We do both. Um, yeah, I mean, link, unless you have an extraordinary network that um, is Define very, extraordinary. How many, <laughs> how many people require it to be extraordinary? It's more around, uh, I'd say it's more focused on, like, is your network full of, of actual prospects of yours? Are they just buddies? Friends and family? Yes, exactly. <laughs> versus, versus qualified leads. Uh, if they're not, you probably want to boost it. And, and, you know, the, the good thing about, a lot, about uh, all things marketing, too, um, I've heard, uh, you know, multiple people talk about it this way, is almost treat it like you would, uh, you know, like a VC portfolio, where you're investing in companies, you try a bunch of different avenues, you see what's working, and then you double down on the ones that are doing well. So if you think through all these different channels of marketing, LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever it might be, and you do you know, baseline metrics to understand, you know, what, what is performing, what is uh, most cost effective, um, you know, pour more resources into that. So definitely worth experimenting with that. Um, like earlier stage yeah, I mean, the ideal situation is if you can build up, you know, influence and a following to a point that when you do launch your, your, your product that there are people already that are on board with the idea and are already consuming your content actively and are excited to, for that day to come. Um, so I would say start, you know, ASAP if you are, you know, pre-product, you know, that's the ideal, ideal situation. Um, I would say beyond that, uh, you know, we see a lot of people who, um, like one, one good example is GrooveHQ.com. Um, there's somebody who they weren't even necessarily, I would say, a subject matter expert within their industry necessarily, but they were speaking to entrepreneurs, like selling to entrepreneurs. So they had the foresight to think, hey, we're, going, we're launching this startup. We are still way out before we're ready to actually, you know, way pre revenue. We're not going to be launching something yet. Let's blog and document and showcase our journey from launching, from ideation to launch to post launch. Um, and because they were selling out to entrepreneurs, they were writing about entrepreneurial content on, here's how I'm doing my market validation, here's how I, I found product market fit. They, they're talking about things that are just documenting their, their actual strategy, or documenting what they went through, um, but it appeals to their actual and qualified prospect in the end. So if you can think through ideas like that, how can we create content that uh, you know, our, our ideal qualified prospect is going to love along the way and follow us and root for us along the way, um, that's you know when you build a following, you pre launch. Well, create, create a relationship before an ask, before you ever you are close to an ask. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and a lot of these people, like when you're going, uh, you know, if you're giving the, the right calls to action, the right game pieces of content, you should have, you know, ideally multiple, where one is, is geared towards people who are keep, you know, here in the buying process, and one are, is giving their you know, six months or a year out from working with you, and then one is geared towards, hey, maybe this is the step before they're ready to work with you. So you can kind of cater to each different piece of the funnel and uh, how far along that lead is in the buying process. You're, you're creating content that addresses everything along the way. Who should we be reaching out to? You know, um, Harvard Business Review, Fast What's Company, Entrepreneur. Like, who do we actually submit if we if we're going to do this independently? Yeah. Who do we, who do we even how do we even go about doing submitting an article? How do you like pitch an editor? You mean? Yeah. Um, so a lot of, I mean, uh, it's funny, all, you know, editors are people too, <laughs> so <laughs> first and foremost, treating it like a, a relationship and understanding what are ways you can find value for them, um, whether it be maybe it's a journalist who is covering a certain beat and uh, they really want to be exciting technology in, in your industry and you start to you know, you, uh, you build a relationship with them on LinkedIn or Twitter or at a conference or whatever it might be and then you send them introductions to really great companies and you start to do things that are of value to them. Uh, building that relationship with them goes a very, very long way. Um, I would say some publications like, um, I know Forbes has pivoted to a contributor model that um, it's a, a paid contributorship for a lot of their stuff. So some of them you can even pay for a column. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a, still in the end, 
uh, you know, if you're paying for regular access, if, you know, I think they're once a month you can publish on there. So there's a handful that are experimenting with that because these publications are trying to figure out how to make money too. Like they, you know, a lot of them are struggling. Uh, so they're, they're, they want this great content. They're open to suggestions, but first and foremost, I'd say try to build a one-to-one -one relationship with them, whether it be virtually through social media and um, you know, even you know, submitting on a contact form on, on site. If you submit a submit something that you know is going to be valuable to them, rather than just say, "Hey, publish my article," like, you know, if you lead with giving first, uh, that's going to take you a lot further. So talk about your giving strategy, because I do think that yeah. I do think that is critical in this mm -hmm. in this where we're at now. Yeah, for uh, just in general. Or well, yeah, I mean, your you know your you know you mean your connector. You connect people. You don't ask for mm -hmm. anything in return. I mean, yeah. I think that, I think that's I think what you just said is you have to build a relationship before. So you gain some credibility before you can then before you get to the top of the pile. Yeah, and, and even you know if you do it the right way, a lot of times then they'll rely on you. You won't even have to make that ask. They'll say, "Hey, I know you're an expert in this. Like, can you bring away on this type of thing?" Um, but yeah, I mean, I would say first and foremost, trying to be a resource for them. You know, one a connector where you, you know try, just try to identify who do you need to know. What's going to make your job easier? Who are the people that are hard for you to get in front of that I can try to help look out for you? So asking discovery questions around that to understand, you know, what's going to make their life easier in the end. Um, I'd say first and foremost, and then um, when you actually do get the chance to submit content, um, do your research to understand what types of content on their site are performing and doing very well, and getting people that to, to share them. And uh, you know, you can uh, you know, use a variety of social media measurement tools to kind of identify, um, you know, what what trending topics are. Like BuzzSumo is a pretty good one that. And say, hey, here are different trending topics within the industry. Using a lot of data-driven strategies, so that way, when you do get that shot, it's most optimized to really resonate with that particular readership. Um, is the way you're gonna, you know, try to hit a home run on the first one, and then, you know, build a, a relationship there and have a, a you know, a, a door open for future ones. Uh, any recommended books for uh, publishing specific? Um, for pub for reaching out to publications. You know, there is one book which is funny. And we're, <laughs> it's from uh, our former CEO now on the board. Um, Top of mind is the name of the book, um, but um, it, it's more focused on yes, getting into publications, but then how do you build influence overall and then stay top of mind with your entire network? Um, so it's a lot of things I'm talking about today around using content as a way to, to scale yourself. Um, that I would say that's one of the best out there for this specific thing. Um, a little biased, but you know, we wrote it because we saw it. Uh, just curiosity, uh, uh, Pat, you mentioned your company is located in Columbia, Missouri? Yeah, HQ's in Columbia, um, CET, we have a team. So we have an office here. Yeah. 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 yeah, so second floor in CET, yeah, so come say hi if uh, you're over there. Oh. But, um, and then we've got uh, a few people in Kansas City, um, a few in Denver, and then Renault as well. So uh, largely uh, in Missouri. But. And how long have you been in business? So been around since 2011, and I came on 2012. Um, so yeah, I don't know when you stop saying startup, but we're, we try to. Soon, <laughs> so, my friends. Yeah, we're getting old. I don't know. <laughs> what about click through rate? Open rates? I mean, like what? Like where? Where is the benchmark? Uh -huh. B to, I think it's B to C first and B to B. Uh huh. So if you, if you're well, I mean, again, if you're putting out blog posts or. Like what, you know, the newsletters or posting? Yeah, how do you know if it's doing well? Right. Yeah. Um, it's hard to answer that just because it varies very, very drastically from industry to industry. Um, I mean, in this, you know, broadly, I know email <coughs> open rates are something like 3 or 4%, so it's not good. Um, but, so if you can beat that, that's a good baseline broadly. But um, if you can dig in a little bit more around, um, you know, a lot of industries have uh, kind of, you know, go-to, uh, you know, data collection, or, you know, uh, I guess, Highly, highly research intensive uh, publications. So, like for us, um, you know, we use a lot of like data.gov type stuff or HubSpot, which has a ton of uh, first hand research within content marketing. Um, content Marketing Institute does that. So, I don't know if they're in a lot of industries you'll find a, a equivalent. There you go. I'm just like, who, who is this? Who is this? Oh, go ahead. So yeah. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of industries have something that's putting out a lot of first hand research, and that's what we find for our industry. A lot of statistics that we can use, but Three to four percent is broadly, you know, your uh, industry standard. So if you can meet that, you're at least in that, you know, above average. 
Also, this is that's my uh, just general booking link. If you want to chat at all um, on LinkedIn, love to connect. Um, like I said, I'm down the street as well. So um, you know, I, I love teaching people about this stuff, doing workshops around this. Um, I'll advise like capital innovators and startups around town. So anyway, can be helpful. Um, let me know. You did good on time. Okay. So, yeah. okay, so the next group is in here at 630, so Matt will be up here for a few minutes if you guys have individual questions. Um, but as we approach 630, we we'll probably move into the out of respect for the space people. NASA's coming in here after us. And uh, again, if you need a copy of our map, it's in the back. Um, and uh, we run out, we got more of those people.